everyone, this is Bob Souza speaking from historic Main Street in Somerset Village. Very happy to be here at Channel 9 SATV today to present the life and times of the late great Ernie Banks. Born January 31st, 1931, passed away January 23, 23 2015, one week short of his 84th birthday. He was known as Mr. Cub, and certainly from 1953 to 1971 was the most positive influence in baseball in Chicago's, on Chicago's north side uh, at Wrigley Field. He was an all-star 14 times, Hall of Famer 1977, and of course a shortstop from 1953 to 1961. In 62, he converted and became a first baseman because of aching legs and father time catching up with him in that area. However, 1958 and 1959, he was most valuable player for a second division Cub team. It was first time that a player had been selected most valuable player in consecutive years. 58 and 59, big years for Mr. Cub, Ernie Banks. And of course, the most beautiful personality of any major leaguer. It's a beautiful day, he often said, let's play two. I would say that he would also be known for his friendship among ball players, stating that it only takes time, a little bit of time to get to love each other. We should all love the game of baseball and love each other. Today's video features a narrator, Chris Chandler, who did the program in 1991 with host Reggie Jackson, Major League Hall of Famer, star player for the Oakland Athletics and New York Yankees. And of course, Reggie did a marvelous job as an interview, interviewer of Ernie Banks, tracing Ernie's career from the Negro Leagues, the Kansas City Monarchs, on to the signing with the Chicago Cubs. So sit back and relax and enjoy our video presentation today of Mr. Cub, Ernie Banks, and Reggie Jackson will be our host. Today at the Dana Point Resort in Dana Point, California, greatest sports legends host Reggie Jackson meets with one of the all-time great home run hitters in baseball history, Ernie Banks. Ernie played 19 years for the Chicago Cubs, and despite his slim physique, he had tremendous power. Five times he hit 40 or more home runs in a single season. Twice, Ernie Banks was named the league's most valuable player. Known by many as the greatest slugging shortstop in baseball history, Ernie Banks became only the ninth player ever to hit 500 home runs in a career. Jarvis fires away. That's a fly ball, beat the left, back, back, that's it, that's it, hey, hey, he did it, Ernie Banks got number 500. Ernie Banks, always smiling always upbeat. This is the way baseball fans remember number 14 of the Chicago Cubs. Ernie played his whole career for a team that almost always finished last in their division. But that didn't stop this future Hall of Famer from playing like an all-star for 19 years. When fans came out to Wrigley Field, they could always count on Ernie to brighten their day, even when their team was out of contention. Ernie was a great promoter for Cubs baseball, and his tremendous loyalty to this organization earned him the nickname, Mr. Cub. Ah, it's a beautiful day. Reggie, let's play two today. Ernie Banks, Mr. Cub, how are you, pal? Just wonderful. Ernie, don't you ever change, buddy? 
Well, I do in a lot of ways. I'm losing my hair. Uh, my knees are going a little bit. <laughs> I got the big pot belly. But you still want to play, too? I sure do. <laughs> Ernie, when people talk about Ernie Banks, Mr. Cub, number 14, 512 home runs, a fabulous power hitter, most valuable player awards, but the thing that stands out most in everybody's mind is your wonderful personality, your love of the game, one of the great personalities of baseball. Why were you such a guy that was so effervescent? Reggie, I came from a family of 12, seven boys and five girls. And I learned when I was 12 years old that, uh, I mean, life is just wonderful. And when you have to live from one day to the next to, to eat and survive in a large family. Uh, and when I arrived to the major leagues, I just said, wow, what a life to be able to play Major League Baseball. And I just fell in love with the game, the people, the city, and it helped develop a good, positive mental attitude. Growing up in Dallas, big family. You played all kinds of sports in high school. You then left high school and wound up playing with the Kansas City Monarchs of the Negro Leagues. How did that come about? Well, first of all, I was playing softball uh, in Dallas, and I lived near the high school, and mm -hmm. I'd go and play. And one day, a guy named Hank Thompson came in uh, Thompson. to visit us. Yeah, he you played play with the Giants. That's right. So Hank saw me playing. He came up to hey. He said, I'm going to recommend you to the Giants. I mean, you really have good wrists, good hands, and you know how to play baseball. Have you ever played? I said, no, I never played baseball. So then another young man came over by the name of Bill Blair, and he said, I've got a team I want you to play on out in Amarillo, Texas. Would you like to play? So I said, well, I'll go home and ask my mom and dad, and I'd like to give it a try. Ernie would take advantage of this opportunity and join the Amarillo Colts. Playing shortstop, Banks developed into a graceful fielder and powerful hitter. Two years later, he signed with the Kansas City Monarchs of the Negro American League. The Monarchs were considered the New York Yankees of the Negro Leagues, featuring star players such as Jackie Robinson, who became the first black to join the major leagues in 1947. With this new opening for black ballplayers, major league teams began to scout the Monarchs for more big league prospects. In 1953, 22-year-old Ernie Banks was signed by the Chicago Cubs, becoming the first black to join this organization. In Ernie's first full season, 1954, he batted 275 with 19 home runs, showing unusual power for a shortstop. But the next season, Banks shocked the league when he blasted 44 home runs and drove in 117 runs. His 44 home runs was a record for a shortstop. Ernie also set another record that year by hitting five grand slams. Where'd you get the power from? People talk about you were slight of build, thin, had great wrist, great movement, just a shortstop. You're supposed to be able to cover a lot of ground, so you really can't be heavy. But where'd you get the power from to produce so many homers? Well, I was uh, 170 pounds, and what I did... Well, things have changed, haven't they? <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you get all that power from? Well, most of my wrists. I uh -huh. uh, really uh, worked very hard as a kid to develop quick, quick hands. Uh -huh. I used to pick cotton with my dad, and, and picking cotton, you, you get out on your knees, and you just pull the cotton, and I learned how to develop my hands, uh -huh. quick, fast hands. I used to take pennies, and put on the back of my hand and throw them up and catch them. But I worked at developing hand speed. Mm -hmm. Now, it was a little different at that time in baseball because I don't think there was too many players that they noticed that much except Hank Aaron when he came into the mm -hmm. league. So Hank and I kind of joined hands in the National League, and we were the first two uh, the wrist players, hitters. the wrist hitters. And uh, it was an amazing phenomenon. But I worked very hard to develop the strength and quickness in my hands, and it was an advantage for me as a major league player. Mm -hmm. While playing shortstop, Ernie Banks would hit 40 or more home runs five times during his career, making him the greatest slugging shortstop in baseball history. Ernie, when you first joined the Chicago Cubs, you were 22 years of age after being there a couple of years, having good years, all of a sudden you become a star, 
people start expecting things from you, the big hit, the home run, the RBI. What's it feel like just after a couple seasons there, being the main man, they're starting to count on you? It was a real good feeling to be counted on, to be in the spotlight. Uh, and I seem to function better when uh, uh, those situations arise. I mean, being up at the play with the bases loaded, the two hours, the game's on the line. So I really enjoy that. I train for it afterwards. I've always planted in my mind that I wanted to be up at the plate when the game was on the line, mm -hmm. where I could win the game for the Cubs. So I kind of worked for that, and I really enjoyed it. While batting cleanup for the Chicago Cubs, Ernie Banks was always among the league leaders in hitting. The National League had many great power hitters who battled every year for the title Most Valuable Player. There was Hammer and Hank Aaron of the Milwaukee Braves. Eddie Matthews, the Braves' third baseman. Duke Snyder of the Dodgers. Willie Mays of the Giants. Stan the Man Musial of the Cardinals. And Frank Robinson of the Cincinnati Reds. In 1958, Ernie Banks blasted 47 home runs and had 129 RBIs to lead the league in both categories. His batting average was a career high 313, and fittingly, he was named the league's most valuable player. Ernie 1958, most valuable player award, lead the league in home runs, RBIs. A fabulous accomplishment considering your team did not do that well. How'd you feel about that? Well, I got the call uh, in 1958 of November that I was the most valuable player in the National League, and it was just uh, overwhelming. It's mm -hmm. just, I mean, this this is can't be true. I mean, there's so many great players that had great years that year, Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, Warren Spahn, and many others, and I just felt so elated over that, and people began to come into my life. There was more demands on my time, and, and uh, I had a family started at that time, twin boys and a little girl, and and I was trying to focus on that and yet share my most valuable player awards with the fans who followed my career and supported me. So it was a good balance in my life and I was very, very happy. Ernie went on to capture the most valuable player award again in 1959 when he hit 45 home runs with 143 RBIs. So great were Ernie's offensive numbers that it was easy to overlook his play in the field. Arthur Daly, a New York Times columnist, once described Banks' play this way. He's a graceful, flowing fielder with wide range, strong arm, and good speed. Did you ever feel that your feeling was underrated? Yes, I did. Uh, because of the offensive uh, skills that I had, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the media fans uh, kind of felt that my feeling wasn't up to par, that mm -hmm. I couldn't move as well, my arm wasn't as strong, but I worked very hard in that area to uh, overcome that uh, negative aspect of my, my game, mm -hmm. and uh, I've worked with uh, many good infielders on how to play Pee Wee Reese and, and uh, Bo Melt Millen to, to work with my feeling, and I, I, I have improved my feeling a great deal. Great deal. You, you uh, set a record one year for fewest errors as a shortstop, yes? 1959, yeah, I made 12 errors, and, and a lot of people didn't realize it or didn't believe it. <laughs> 12 errors, I mean, how did that happen? He must have had the official scores on his side. Uh -huh. So, but I, I worked very hard at it, and I truly believe in it, Reggie. I mean, uh, putting the time and effort in it and being committed to something, I mean, you will get results, uh -huh. and that's what I did. I worked a lot in the off-season playing handball and learning how to play the ball off the wall, and. Uh, you know, my hand-eye coordination was better. My quickness. So my quickness, yeah, so it helped. Ernie's hard work really paid off in 1960 when he won the prestigious Gold Glove Award as the best fielding shortstop in the National League. One of the great sluggers of the game, Ernie proved he was a great fielder as well. Ernie, 1961, from 
shortstop, you moved to first base. Was it a welcome change for you? Yes, it was, Reggie. I enjoyed it. Uh, my legs was a little slow at the time, and I mm -hmm. wasn't moving as quick, had a bad knee. So when I got to first base, I truly enjoyed it for one reason, that when the runner got on first base, I had a chance to talk to him. And <laughs> you get, like to talk. I like to talk <laughs> at that point in my career. And uh, every time some kid got on first base with their first hit, I said, wow, that's tremendous. You got your first hit in Wrigley Field. And then we'll start a little conversation going. But I enjoy that very much. During the 1960s, Ernie Banks and the Chicago Cubs seemed to follow the same script they acted out during the 50s. While Ernie consistently blasted home runs and supplied the bulk of his team's offense, the Cubs were out of the pennant race by early June and destined to finish in the bottom of their division. Then in 1969, the Cubs finally came together as a team and actually held first place for most of the season. But in late September, they were overtaken by the New York Mets, and Ernie Banks' hopes of winning a pennant were ruined. Ernie, after that loss, you said it was a dreary day at the ballpark, not many fans, the Mets win, the Cubs lose. You had to be down. What did you do after the ball game when you realized it was over? Well, I slowly got undressed and took a shower and came out of the ballpark and got in my car and my kids weren't there that day because of school in September. So I drove along Lake Michigan just thinking about how and why and, and what for and trying to figure out what really went wrong. I mean, here we had this thing in the bag and the bag broke. So I stopped around 35th Street and got out and walked along Lake Michigan and just kind of reflected back on, on the year. And I thought of one thing, that Mr. Wrigley got a letter from a fan after the season had ended and said that of all the things that happened in Chicago in 1969, she knew her daughter was at Wrigley Field. It was a safe place, a nice place. She had a wonderful summer. And even though we didn't win the pennant, it made an awful lot of kids happy. They were going to spend their summers at Wrigley Field. So I thought about the real big picture that although we didn't get into the World Series, I didn't get a chance to play in a playoffs, a World Series game that had helped so many other people, uh, especially young people who came to Wrigley Field that summer. Even though Ernie Banks would never get a chance to bring a World Series to Wrigley Field, he did provide the Cubs faithful with many memorable moments. In 1970, at the age of 40, Ernie was fast approaching his 500th career home run. On May 9th, he hit number 499 at Wrigley Field. That's it. That's way back there. Back, back, back. Hey, hey. Hey. Ernie did it. Number 499. Ernie, in baseball, there are a few milestones that are really special. 300 victories, 3,000 base hits, and the one that everybody cherishes. 500 home runs. You hit 500 home runs. Can you recall the day that you hit number 500? I certainly can. It was May 12, 1970. I got up in the morning about 7.30. My daughter Jan said, Dad, please hit number 500 today because these people are driving me crazy. So I got in the car. I said, I'm going to do my best. Got in the car and drove out to Wrigley Field, turned the radio on. I was listening to Nat King Cole singing Bring out those lazy, hazy, daisy days of summer. And I was just listening to music, kind of got me, you know, kind of relaxed and a good feeling. And I was looking at all the scenery as there I drove up the lake. So I got to the ballpark, got dressed. We playing the Braves. Pat Jarvis was starting that day for the Braves. Number 33. That's right, Pat Jarvis. So the first time up, there's only about 5,000 people in the stand. I said, I was walking up to the plate, I said, boy, I got to do something to make the people happy today. And in my mind, I don't know why we kept saying that. I gotta do something today to make people happy. So I stepped in the batter's box. Jarvis fires away. That's a fly ball, beat the left, back, back! That's it, that's it! Hey, hey, he did it! Ernie Banks got number 500! A line drive shot into the seats and left. The ball tossed to the bullpen. Everybody on your feet, this is it. Woo! 
Ernie Banks, from the very first moment he put on a Cubs uniform, performed like he belonged in Cooperstown. 512 home runs, two-time most valuable player, eight seasons with over 100 runs batted in, and a Gold Glove Award. Ernie played 19 years for the Chicago Cubs, and then in his first year of eligibility, he was inducted into baseball's Hall of Fame. Thank you very much, Commissioner, for the fine introduction. We got the set in, sunshine, fresh air. We got the team behind us. So let's play too. Ernie, when you left the game, can you tell me what you missed most? Well, I missed the, uh, the camaraderie, the, the, the challenge each day of mm -hmm. going out and doing something, uh, hitting the ball, catching the ball, winning a game. I, I really missed that. I also miss uh, the fact that uh, being on a baseball field, that you have total control of your life. I felt that when I was out there, you know, I knew when to throw the ball, catch the ball, swing the bat. It was nobody else telling me what to do and how to do it. I did it mostly on my own. Mm -hmm. And I miss that, you know, and uh, it's it just the camaraderie and the love for the game and the players who played it, and, and each day is different. Ernie, you want to take this time for sharing some time with us, bringing a bright light into our life and sharing some of that wonderful, upbeat attitude with us. Not only were you a Hall of Famer on the field, but from what I know of you, you're a Hall of Famer off the field. You didn't earn the name Mr. Cub for nothing. I want to thank you for coming down to the Dana Point Resort and sharing your career with us on Greatest Sports Legends. Thank you. Can I say one thing? Yes, sir. What I was really telling everyone, Reggie, is the spirit of friendship is the balance to life. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. Ernie Banks, Mr. Sunshine, Mr. Cub, one of the greatest sluggers in baseball history and a legend for all times. Once again, we'd like to reiterate some of the accomplishments of Ernie Banks. From 1955 to 1960, he hit the most home runs of any major league player. In his own league, that includes such greats as Stan Musial and Henry Aaron, Frank Robinson, and in the American League, also Willie Mays of the National League, in the American League, Mickey Mantle, Ted Williams, among others. So that uh, he was certainly the most outstanding. In 1955, for five Grand Slam home runs, which remained as a record until 1987, when Don Mattingly hit six Grand Slam home runs in a season. And of course, that was as a member of the New York Yankees. Also, as we wrap up the program, we get the legendary Hall of Fame Chicago broadcaster Jack Brickhouse calling home runs number 500 and 512 for Mr. Cub Ernie Banks. Entering the 1970 season, the Cubs Ernie Banks needed three home runs to reach 500. The dramatic countdown started at Wrigley Field. There's a high fly, deep to left. Miller and Wynn, both back, 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 and high! It's a home run for Banks, and a boy Ernie! Here's Ernie. That's it. That's way back there. Back, back, back. Hey, hey. Ernie did it. Number 499.
Well, here it is, Tuesday, May the 12th, 1970. And Ernie Banks comes to bat with two out and nobody on in the Cub half of the second inning against Atlanta. Score, Atlanta two, the Cubs nothing. Ernie Banks hitting 241 at the moment. Two home runs, 13 runs batted in. 499 lifetime homers. Here we go. Foul ball, strike one. He has narrowly missed getting a home run the last couple of days with triples high off that wall and left. Strike one. It's a ball, one and one. The wind is not a big factor. It's out of the southeast at seven miles an hour. Jarvis fires away. That's a fly ball deep the left. Back, back. That's it. That's it. Hey, hey. He did it. Ernie Banks got number 500. A line drive shot into the seats and left. The ball tossed to the bullpen. Everybody on your feet. This is it. Here's the replay on it. Waist high. Good line drive shot. Here it is going into those seats in slow motion. Made it. Just over the wall. Bounced in and out. And here is one of the great moments in baseball history in the United States of America and particularly in Chicago. President Obama in the year 2013 with his Presidential Medal of Freedom presented to Ernie Banks at the White House in a stirring ceremony. A great honor well received. President Obama, a Chicago native himself, was a Southside Chicago White Sox fan, but he recognized the true brilliance of Ernie Banks as a uh, North Sider on Wrigley Field with the Cubs. Today, we salute fierce competitors who became true champions. In the sweltering heat of a Chicago summer, Ernie Banks walked into the Cubs locker room and didn't like what he saw. Everybody was sitting around Heads down to press, he recalled. So Ernie piped up and said, boy, what a great day. Let's play two. <laughs> That's Mr. Cub, the man who came up through the Negro Leagues making $7 a day and became the first black player to suit up for the Cubs and one of the greatest hitters uh, of all time. And in the process, Ernie became known as much for his 512 home runs as for his cheer and his optimism and his eternal faith that someday the Cubs would go all the way. <laughs> and and that's, that's serious belief. <laughs> that is something that even a White Sox fan like me can respect. Uh, but he is just a wonderful man and, and uh, a, a great icon uh, of my hometown. Ernie? Banks. <laughs> With an unmatched enthusiasm for America's pastime, Ernie Banks slugged, sprinted, and smiled his way into the record books. Known to fans as Mr. Cub, he played an extraordinary 19 seasons with the Chicago Cubs, during which he was named to 11 All-Star teams, hit over 500 home runs, and won back-to-back -back Most Valuable Player honors. Ernie Banks was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1977, and he will forever be known as one of the finest power hitters and most dynamic players of all time.
also the first African-American coach in baseball with the Chicago Cubs in 1962, Buck O'Neill, who was a pioneer and great manager in the Negro Leagues with the Kansas City Monarchs, became the first of his race to be a major league coach as a Cub in 1962. Going back March 31st, 2008, the statue of Ernie Banks outside Wrigley Field. Great tribute to Mr. Cub. And of course, when Ernie passed away, they moved the statue downtown Chicago for a week so that people could go down and take the uh, videos of it, the Instagram, instant phone pictures, and uh, be there with Ernie Banks himself. To close out the program, we have the legendary singer Frank Sinatra giving his rendition of Chicago, It's a Wonderful Town. Thanks for watching, folks. For all baseball fans, not only in the United States, but in particular Chicago, we will be rounding third and heading home. Thanks for watching. There it is! Mr. Banks has just had his 500th career homer. He is getting the standing ovation. My life at Wrigley is memories, that's it, memories. I have memories of Wrigley Field. You talk about somebody hit the whole rod, that's what you're supposed to do. You don't make a big deal out of it, that's what you're supposed to do. So just doing what you're supposed to do in my life. That's the way I kind of look at things. Ernie Banks, what'd you think when you saw him? Oh man, it was big, great hands, great hands and could hit that little pitch I th and this is major league you know the major leagues that's what major leagues say pitch the ball keep the ball down keep the ball down i said well he gonna play him out in the major leagues and he did actually he was shy now could you believe any banks was shy you couldn't could you you know like the other guys was riding around i want to go here and see this i'm gonna see this chick over here that wasn't any bank no quiet wouldn't say too much and I'm speaking of Ernie Banks, the great rookie shortstop of the Chicago Cubs, or he was a rookie last year. Ernie, you look like you're ready to go for 1955. Yeah, already, Bert. I understand that you might have gone to the New York Yankees or the Chicago White Sox, but Wood Matthews kept uh, after somebody and got you in the Chicago Cub organization. Well, well, Bert, I think it's a fine organization, and uh, I really like playing with the Cubs. And I, what I think he, after seeing me talk and doing things with different people, and when he got in the major leagues, I said, man, you got to open up here. Uh -huh. And he started talking and he hadn't stopped yet. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you about your 500th home run, and I'm sure you've been asked this like countless times. He has narrowly missed. It was May 12, 1970. Run, My daughter, before I left for the park, uh, had mentioned, Dad, please uh, uh, do that home run or whatever you need to do today. So. We can get some rest, it's a piece. Off that wall and do the fastball inside. And normally, like as you mature in baseball, most pitchers feel that that's the pitch you can't hit. So I was just kind of anticipating that, and he it's threw ball, it. And one and one. Very fortunate to go out of the park. Jarvis fires away. That's a fly ball, beat the left, back, back! That's it! That's it! Hey, hey! He did it! Ernie Banks got number 500! But the main thing in that game is Ron Santo hit the home run to win the game, and I was so happy with him to do that. Well, this is my kind of infield. I don't know about you, but I love these guys. They're all great. <laughs> what I see in winning, everybody got to like each other just one time. Everybody. Front office, manager, coaches, players, coaches. Fans, everybody got to like each other just one time. That's hard to do now. We're here this morning to celebrate and honor a Chicago hero and a baseball legend, Ernie Banks. Nobody who sees the statue, they gonna know who I am. A lot of kids have know what I even played. I have grandkids, and they don't know what I did. They really don't. They never seen it, they don't know. Like for instance, I'm with the Washington, they get the Battle of Freedom Award. 
Barack Obama gave it to me. He never seen me play. So I talked to some people. I said, now, maybe I put a, a voicemail on the statue, you know, to say who I am. Hey, I'm Ernie Banks. I played at this ballpark over here. This was happening and that was happening. Uh, I mean, just to do that, you know, to voice it to young kids who see it and don't know what it is or know who you are. Chicago, Chicago, a title in town. Chicago, I bet your bottom dollar you'll lose the blues in Chicago. Chicago, town that Billy Sunday couldn't shut down. On State Street, that the great street, I'd just like to say they do things you won't see on Broadway You'll have the time the time of your life Saw a cat who swung with his wife in Chicago My hometown Chicago Chicago Toddling town Swinging town Chicago Chicago I'm gonna show you around Bet your bottom dollar you lose the blues in Chicago, Chicago, the town that Billy Sunday never shut down. On State Street, that great street, I'd just like to say, they do things you won't see on Broadway. You'll have the time, the time of your life. I saw a man who danced with his wife in Chicago, Chicago, 